I think what's been mo even more interesting than the way that AI sort of was integrated into the book is the way the discourse around the book changed between okay. when it came out and the beginning of 2023. Right. When it came out in October of 2022, and this just goes to show how quickly our society moves sometimes, this was entirely a book about octopuses right. and communicating with an octopus. Same book. So all of the reviews were about the octopus. Um, readers who were disappointed in the book were disappointed that there, was, there wasn't enough octopus for them in the book because they felt like that was that should have been the, the primary focus of the book. So that's October. By January, this was a book about artificial intelligence. You're the author, obviously, of The Mountain in, in the Sea. Um, I read it a few months ago, or a few weeks ago, rather. Um, fascinating book. Something that I think was just really like a book for our times. Um, some of those kind of themes that are involved there with, with environmentalism, with AI, um, and this kind of underlying uh, undercurrent of the kind of curiosities of international relations and how that kind of, how that kind of links into all of those questions. Um, so I kind of really wanted to just ask you to kind of introduce yourself initially and maybe tell some of our readers about um, a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I um, see where to start. I was born in, in Quebec, uh, grew up in California and uh, attended the University of California at Santa Cruz, got a degree in modern literature, mm -hmm. kind of hung around uh, writing and doing odd jobs and the kind of things that you do with a modern literature undergraduate degree, which is, yeah. you know, uh, odd jobs. And uh, and then I joined the Peace Corps in 2003, and I went to Turkmenistan. And since 2003, I pretty much lived abroad, um, either in the Peace Corps or afterwards working for a, a company called American Councils that did educational exchange in Moscow. Then I was in um, back in D.C. very briefly, went back out and was in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, in Afghanistan back in Moscow, then over to Tajikistan for a few years, and then I joined the Foreign Service. And in the Foreign Service, I served in Vietnam. Um, I was on Kondal, where the book, The Mountain and the Sea, is yeah. uh, is based, um, and living in Ho Chi Minh City there. And then after that, I was in Kyrgyzstan again, um, Azerbaijan, and then Kosovo, the, the latest, for three years, and I finally returned to live possibly permanently, or at least for some longer period of time back here in the United States. So I basically was, was overseas for almost two decades. And I think that's oh, a big, yeah. that's a big influence on the, on the book, of course. Um, just the experience of being an alien yeah. <laughs> I think gives you some insight into the, the difficulties of cross-cultural communication and how those might be, how those might sort of prefigure the difficulties of cross-species communication in a sense right yeah absolutely um i think that was also one of the things that that drew me to it i i lived abroad in various places for about five years or so or so mm -hmm. um, a few years teaching in south korea and i spent quite a long time in in vietnam as well didn't make it to kondao on sadly because that would have been quite interesting but um yeah so I, that that kind of aspect of it was really interesting as well to see how that international background um sort of played out in the book um, but for our readers who haven't haven't actually had a chance to kind of look into the book at all, um, could you just give us a quick rundown maybe of like the premise and uh, the kind of things you explore there? Sure. So the book is at its most basic level, it is about a scientist who travels to an archipelago of islands called Kondal, the Kondal Archipelago. Uh, the main island is called Konsan. Um, and she is there to try to establish communication with what might be the world's first uh, other species that communicates in symbols, yeah. um, an octopus species. She's there with a very small team of uh, an android, the world's first and possibly last, and then a security officer. And then the book has two other threads. One of them follows uh, a, a hacker named Rustem, who has been hired to penetrate some kind of uh, AI mind, which is more complex than anything he's ever done before. And the third thread follows Eiko, who is a slave on an AI captained uh, shipping trawler. Yeah. And the, the book sort of uses those three stories to examine 
uh, communication and authority and AI and many other uh, elements along the way. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and the way that those kind of intersect, I think, is probably one of the most interesting things about the book for me. Um, but what drew it or what drew me to it originally actually was um, I first became aware of it. I went to see an art exhibition at the Hayward Gallery in London and um, they had a lovely promotional uh, section for your book there uh, with actually, oh. just spotted this excellent cover. So I was just <laughs> when I when I first saw it, I was like, what's this is interesting. What's this cover with all the uh, the tentacles on it, etc. A little look on the um, on the background and just uh sorry, on the, in, on the back of the book, and then just thought, oh, okay, AI, octopuses, like civilizations uh, mm. underwater. This this is something potentially that would be right up my street. Um, so I suppose I'm kind of curious, like how how did you kind of get to the question of actually trying to look into octopus communication? And then how did that kind of link to to AI for you? Like how did you kind of connect those two threads and where did that come from? Yeah, so when I first... I think was conceptualizing the book. My first idea that it was going was that it was going to be a book about communicating with uh, the octopus primarily, and I had written a novella, which uh, which which was not published, which I, I withdrew from publication because it was still in submission when the Mountain and the Sea was accepted, and there was too much overlap. And that novella was very concretely about a first contact story in which it's a you know it's a it's a really direct story of trying to understand a species, an alien species in the case of that novella. Um, but I sort of reworked that idea into, into this novel, kind of stole a lot. And I stole so much from my own novella that that sort of became unpublishable, which sometimes happens. I kind of cannibalized those ideas. And then when I started writing the book, I think the sort of magic moment, because sort of what happens, I think, when you're writing is, you have a conscious idea of where you're going, but then you've got a lot of other things, of course, going on in your brain. And, you know, as you, as you know, there's just a lot going on under the surface that you're not aware of, sure. uh, and not quite in control of. And so when you're writing and you're, you're, especially when you're sort of writing at speed and you've gotten into something, then things become sort of emergence. And what happened with this book was, I think I was in chapter four and I had not figured out who the third person uh, of the of the team would be on the island. Ha had landed on the island. I was writing very blind to just see where things would go. So Ha had landed on the island. She had met Altan Setseg, the security officer, and was walking down to the beach to meet the third person on the team. And I decided, or some part of my brain decided for me, that that third party would not be a, a human, but instead would be the android Evrim. Yeah. And I think that that moment is when it became like a novel in, in, yeah. the, in the truest sense, because a novel needs to be about more than one thing. It really has to be about a, a sort of uh, a weave of separate but sort of meshable ideas. Yeah. And and I think that, that that really settled it for me. And then from there, that ex that exploration of different intelligences inspired many other, you know, attempts to explore different aspects of, of consciousness and intelligence and those things. I had planned to do that with the octopus already. Um, I had, of course, read a lot about biosemiotics and communications, books on paleopoetics and other, you know, uh, you know, the embodiment of meaning, all of this stuff. And I was trying to find a framework that I could put that forward in. I think what's been mo even more interesting than the way that AI sort of was integrated into the book is the way the discourse around the book changed between okay. when it came out and the beginning of 2023. Right. When it came out in October of 2022, and this just goes to show how quickly our society moves sometimes, this was entirely a book about octopuses right. and communicating with an octopus. Same book. So... All of the reviews were about the octopus. Um, readers who were disappointed in the book were disappointed that there, was, there wasn't enough octopus for them in the book because they felt like that was that should have been the, the primary focus of the book. So that's October. By January, this was a book about artificial intelligence. Right. And a review came out in the, I remember it was in the New Scientist, 
that was probably three or four pages long. It was a really extensive positive review. Mm -hmm. I was really happy with it. It didn't mention the octopus once. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, so that was fascinating for me as an author was you write a book and when it comes out, it's one book and three months later, it's quite a different book. Yeah. In the way it's being read and interpreted and talked about. 100%. And I suppose that's, to me, that kind of comes down to the fact that the book is essentially about, it's about communication, right? It's about how humans communicate with things that we are, that are similar to us, but entirely distinct from us. Um, and how we can kind of, how we can bridge that gap. Um, and obviously, like, given the kind of the explosion in AI related discourse over the last year, it's it, it makes sense that everybody would suddenly start to focus on that. But then again, on the other side of things, um, you know, there have been a lot of octopus related things that have been popping up, but I suppose that was a little bit before. Um, Peter Godfrey, Godfrey Smith's um, book, I think you referenced at the end, I read a couple of years ago, I thought was absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, how how did all of those how did you kind of get into kind of researching about about octopuses then is that how how did that link into your your background and the kind of things that you've been doing i i think i, think I have a theory that um every novel that i write is about some sort of obsession that i had ever since i was a kid and okay. once i've i've rid myself of all of those obsessions i probably will have run out of, <laughs> of things to write about because i can remember loving the octopus and thinking that it was a, a fascinating creature back in fifth grade when I did a report on them. Yeah. And I can also remember being in university and talking to other people about how fascinating, it, you know, this, this animal was the different ways that, you know, it had to communicate from us, its curiosity. And that was actually at a time, you know, cause I, I graduated university in the late nineties when we didn't know nearly as much about them as we, as we do now, actually yeah. our knowledge of the octopus and, and the way that it, it's, its body works and its mind works has um, really expanded drastically over the last couple of decades. Yeah. And um, I think part of what I was doing is, you know, similar to what I was doing in Vietnam. So in, in Vietnam, I was working as the environment science technology and health officer, and I was trying to encourage people to pay attention to the environment. And I was trying to think of how we had done that in the United States um, successfully and one of the things that i that i saw that we had done was to choose a charismatic animal mm -hmm. right and get people to focus their empathy and their concern on one charismatic animal and this in the united states it was the save the whales yeah. campaign, right that really focused people first on the ocean mm -hmm. and on what was happening to the whales because whales were somehow something that was that inspired our our empathy our our concern in a way that you know save the sea slugs or you know sea stars <laughs> gonna be a bit more <laughs> difficult <laughs> it, would be, it would be more difficult and so when i was in vietnam i, I actually started a campaign called uh, save the dugong okay the dugong is you know a manatee essentially yeah. right? um a sea cow it is cute and uh and sort of slow moving and and it has like you know short forelimbs and therefore you know is very uh, it, it inspires a sort of empathy and it was yeah. it was deeply endangered possibly even extinct in vietnam nobody really knew and so i started that campaign when i was you know inspired to write a book about like a first contact story but taking first contact very seriously from a sort of hard science biology perspective and placing it on earth rather than first contact with something from space. Um, I think again, I sort of chose the octopus because it is a charismatic animal, right? Definitely. And I knew that it would draw people in. And I, I, it might be, I'm not sure if it's Peter Godfrey Smith who, men who mentions this or, or Cy Montgomery, but um, who wrote The Soul of an Octopus, which is another mm -hmm. great book. Um, but in our aquariums, we really only name three different animals. We name um, the like otters, we name dolphins, and we name the octopus. Interesting, yeah. And, and everything else is just sort of a fish, right? Yeah. Or whatever. So we, we clearly, have th those animals must bear some sort of special importance and what's interesting about those particular three animals is 
it's obvious why we name the otter. Yeah. Right. And it's obvious, I think, why we name the dolphin too, because the dolphin is is a mammal, right? It is like we we clearly have a lot in, in common with it. We recognize something significantly similar to us. It communicates vocally in a way that's really quite similar to the way we communicate. Yeah. And we see a lot of ourselves, and we have this long-standing relationship too with with the dolphin. But why do we name the octopus? Right. It's it's a mollusk. <laughs> it couldn't really be more different. different. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you couldn't. I, you know, I, I've said this before, but like, if if you were an alien and you came to Earth and you encountered an octopus and a human being, you would be like, I don't understand how these two things could be on the same planet. Yeah. How is this possible? Like, how, how did you get here? Yeah. Right. How did you get here and here? Right. So it's an animal where our latest common ancestor is 500 million years ago. Right. A flatworm with some sort of basic visual apparatus probably can only perceive shadow and light. It's been evolving separately from us for 500 million years. And in that time, it's established this big, creative brain this fascinating quick learning you know uh interest in its environment this creativity and i think that's what we really recognize in the octopus is creativity and the octopus's creativity and that similarity with our own curious natures somehow overcomes all that physical di difference and allows us to engage with and and really empathize with this animal yeah. The most different animal may be in the aquarium from us in, in, in many physical, you know, form ways. I mean, effectively as different from us as a sea slug or a, or a, or a star or a sea urchin. Yeah. But then the other fascinating thing is you have all that difference, 500 million years of separate evolution, and you end up with eyes that are almost exactly like our own. Right. Camera eyes with, with basically the same mechanisms that our eyes have. And when you can look at an octopus, you can look an octopus directly in its eyes and it is like looking at a human being. And if, cause it feels really? like they're looking back at you, right? Like yeah. this is that's yeah. kind of one of the, the most fascinating things compared to like virtually all other animals that are not maybe mammals. I mean, maybe you get right. it with some birds and lizards to a certain extent, but yeah, with, with an octopus, that level of intelligence seems evident when you see yes. one, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it, you get caught up in its gaze. And I think, you know, I have a bird feeder, for example, and, and birds are interesting when you look at them, when you look at their whole body and the way they move and stuff, they they are um, really fascinating animals. I love watching them. Actually, when you look them directly in the eyes, they seem quite dead. Right. In animals, quite often, right? There, there's something there's something that actually sort of pushes you back from empathy with a bird when you look them directly in the eye. Right. And that's the opposite of what an octopus does to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose that's the yeah the kind of the kind of blackened eye. If you look at a crow, you know, obviously we know now about the intelligence of crows and how many like steps of decision making they can make and all of these kinds mm -hmm. of interesting things which is again that kind of convergent evolution of intelligence that has come back from however many millions of years um but then it's just curious that the octopus of all of those animals is our most distant like cousin in that regard mm -hmm. yet perhaps um other than the animal other than mammals we kind of we kind of can empathize with them the most so kind of yeah really really interesting in that regard but you know, you, you mentioned kind of looking into like things like biosemiotics and, and this kind of stuff. Um, what what kind of drew you to that kind of symbolic um, understanding of communication and, and how animals communicate from that regard? So I, I don't know a huge amount about that. Um, one of my my editors, both in fact, both my editors, uh, other editors are, are linguists. So unfortunately, they haven't read the book yet, but they probably would have been able to ask some more specific questions about that. But I'm quite curious to see how you how that kind of became a, um, a subject of interest for you. Yeah. So when I was in university, my the time when I was going at the time I was going to university, um, the study of literature was very dominated by theory. Yeah. And and theory in UC Santa Cruz was very dominated by semiotics and the sort of structuralist and post structuralist theory. Yeah. And I was I can actually remember reading. Um, Kaya Silverman's book, The Subject of Semiotics, and feeling as if, you know, literally someone had just gone and put their fingers into my skull, torn it open, and then shoved <laughs> a whole new world inside it. Like, yeah, right. I, I remember sort of closing the book and 
walking around downtown Santa Cruz feeling as if I was on drugs. Right, right. All of a sudden, everything looked completely different to me. And the whole world seemed like a place that I had had just not seen until until that moment. And so semiotics really opened up a whole new way of experiencing meaning for yeah. me. I really, I really mean that it, it feels like people's descriptions sometimes of like a religious experience. And I, I've yeah. had this a few other times um, up to a you know lesser or greater degree. I, I remember when I was in high school reading like Siddhartha, right? Yeah, and then yeah, yeah, so feeling cool. like, you know, I've, 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 I understand the meaning of life. Of course yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? But, um, but this was real. And, and, and because semiotics really has this way of explaining this complex ways in which meaning works and in which we construct things like our sense of self and our sense of where we stand in in society and and, and these kinds of things and i have always been fascinated by it and then biosemiotics really takes that semiotics to a different level it applies it to science it applies it to biology and, and its fundamental argument is is that life is physical as we know, and, and all the things that we scientifically scientifically know about the physical facts of life are true, but on its most fundamental level, what life is, is an exchange of information being interpreted. Yeah. And this is, this is the fascinating sort of turning of biology a little bit on its head. Rather than looking at the physical substrate in which that exchange is taking place, really looking at the ways in which we have both digital and analog meaning making going on at all times in, in, in life. And that this exchange of information, what's interesting about it is that, is that it, it also transcends things like the death of an individual yeah. and it binds all life together in, in a fascinating way. Like one thing that I just, it's hard to get over the thought of is in order for us to be sitting here talking, right? There has to be three and a half billion years of uninterrupted passing of signals yeah. from one living being to another yeah. and inside those living beings and between those living beings and their environment, completely unbroken yeah. right? in order for us to have this conversation. And so all of us are actually a part of a single conversation that began in some clay substrate or pool on earth three and a half billion years ago right everything all of our cellular like all of this is just is, is just part of this vast exchange and that's what biosemiotics sort of does is it forces you to to look at life through the lens of communication yeah and so then you start seeing symbolic communication and, and human culture and all of these things that we do not as fundamentally different from what other species do but as perhaps emergent upon what those other species do. So symbolic communication, which really enables human beings to um, talk about futures that don't exist, right? Like science yeah. fiction pasts that didn't exist or do all of these elaborate communicative, you know, perform all these elaborate communicative acts is an extension of the kind of informational exchange that allows a fox to put one foot in front of another and direct its movement toward a future state, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so you have this instead of conscious human consciousness being completely unlinked from everything else, you have a sense of it as being fully integrated into these consciousnesses and proto consciousnesses that probably stretch all the way down to, you know, bacteria directing its position away from you know, danger and uh, dangerous chemicals and towards sugar sources, for example, yeah, right? Sure. And um, and I think that's just that way of looking at the world as a science fiction writer for me, just opens up, opens a, th a thousand doors, right? Into into how to how to really look a little bit more deeper at what the act of communication really is and how fundamentally profound it is. Definitely. Yeah, I, I find that totally fascinating as well. And this kind of idea that we're all linked together by basically inscriptions of communication going back. I mean, even if we're looking at, you know, we're reading a, a book from, from antiquity or something, I mean, even if you're just considering that distance of time, 
we're talking a few thousand years of of like ideas being constantly right. like reflexively changed and developed and um you know how our communication kind of going back and forth through time in this kind of uh, yeah. it's kind of bizarre yeah. way but but that kind of brings it to like across the technology as well and what what technology actually means like from the perspective of the humans who are making it and i suppose mm-hmm. that kind of that links into the the kind of ai theme of the book as well um but from a more kind of like philosophical perspective i suppose like um are there any kind of uh, do you have any kind of favorite philosophers or people who influenced you or um people who kind of maybe influenced you in general as, as a writer um and then maybe um you know specifically in relation to this book things that you found particularly interesting um yeah favorite philosophers i mean i think that my the the huge influence that i have the sort of mountain um in the middle of all of this is charles uh, sanders purse right yeah probably the first great american philosopher um and i think that he is little understood and um and appreciated mostly because he held no academic positions really mm-hmm. and he he never was able to organize his his thought into concrete publications right it's just collected in these fragments essays yeah. here and there but his his concept of how of how logic and communication and these kinds of uh of things work is is really at the core yeah. of of my thought so so above all probably purse and then jesper hoffmeyer who was was in a way the father of of biosemiotics i think is extremely important um i think sigmund freud is important not because of anything that he actually came to a conclusion on but the way that he sort of opened up the black box of the human brain and said oh there's all of this like weird stuff going on in here right that we don't understand and and i think i think he's a little bit i mean he is he is a subject of of disdain and a, and a target for for a lot of people but i think he needs to be seen in a way like the early astronomers right right he really was he he blazed a, a trail and the and the one thing that he that he really impressed upon us as a society that is the most important thing and i think that changed everything was the idea that we do not understand ourselves yeah. and we do not know where our thoughts are coming from quite often. right yeah yeah and so and i think that that just conceptually changed everything about human existence on the planet he gave us tools that other people would sharpen and and perfect um maybe not even well have not perfected yet but he really gave us tools to understand human perspective and its flaws and I, I think that was that was really important um writers i have uh patricia highsmith uh dorothy b hughes and several other american um especially uh, crime novelists of the sort of mid 20th century i think there was this time in the mid 20th century when when crime novels were probably some of the most amazing prose being written right. and some of most fundamentally sort of experimental and interesting prose and did, did uh, i read somewhere um that you started off writing crime fiction i did like, yeah. yeah 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 i did i mean i sort of i started off writing very briefly writing writing sort of mainstream fiction and then i very quickly moved to sort of noir and, yeah. and crime fiction and i wrote that for a long time and i feel like that was when i was really learning to write um and learning to write uh so I was, I was, I would say, building the toolbox that I would that would exploit later it was yeah. all it was all done during that crime fiction uh, writing phase. So I love those those writers, especially their use of perspective, um, and their sort of use of these psychological um, tricks. You know, the 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 way in which they can merge the narrative voice with the voice of an actual person in the in the novel, so that you are often lulled into thinking that the protagonist is thinking something when really it's like some interjection from from outside and vice yeah. versa. I love yeah. that slippery way that they have of doing that. Um, In a Lonely Place is a great example of that by, by Dorothy B. Hughes. She really, she really masters that. 
that way in which perspective distorts reality completely right it's really and, interesting yeah you know, and and you're just caged by by seeing the world from one person's perspective and then patricia highsmith does it masterfully in the talented mr ripley mm -hmm. which has been made into many many films of varying quality but none of them do what the book does what the book does is it makes you like mr ripley because everyone else is so unlikable right the problem <laughs> right. is Everyone else is so unlikable because you're viewing the world through the eyes of Ripley. Right. right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and so he always feels complete, like he always seems completely justified and you're rooting for him the entire time, which is not the case in the films where, he, right. you know, seen from the outside, he seems like a horrible person. Seen from his own headspace, you know, everyone else seems truly awful and deserving of what happens to them. <laughs> right. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, it's kind of like what people say about a Lolita or, or something like that. Uh -huh. right? You yeah. know, you have the protagonist who you, you're you're essentially reading this this the this horrible like character, but from his right. own perspective, uh, everything is justified, and all these things are, are justified when you're reading it from the perspective of the person who's who's engaged yes. in that world. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And and so I, I really, uh, you know, I love I love that sort of period in American writing, but I I read so widely, mm -hmm. you know, now, especially because I'm often reading for research, and so. I'm reading history, I'm reading, uh, you know, lots of nonfiction, lots of science, still read a lot of theory, because I really feel like theory is just makes my brain work in ways yeah. that, that, you know, nothing else really does. And so, um, you know, I read, I read extremely widely, I have very little time for to concentrate any more than on any, any other genre on like science fiction and fantasy. Yeah. But I read two and um maybe not fantasy so much more more science fiction but that's just a personal taste um yeah. and i think there's different ways of being like different different people have very different kinds of intelligence as we all know and my particular kind is that i am like a sponge right like i pull in all of these external factors and then eventually i'll give back something that is like a you know is de is developed out of that that in a in a different way but that clearly bears that you know the mark of everything i've been if you knew what i was reading you would be able to see oh like this book is basically made out of these hundred books right right, right. through some kind of weird <laughs> personal process yeah i can see it <laughs> like I, I was wondering about that even like on a on a particular level and i don't know whether this is like um things that I was looking into the characters based on my kind of interest as well but like mm -hmm. so in the character of Evram who's the uh the sort of genderless sexless AI um mm -hmm. who essentially has this um quality that they they don't forget anything right mm -hmm. and to me that immediately brought to to mind the story by Borges the Funes the Memorias I don't know if you've uh -huh, read yes. it you know because yeah. that was it was a really interesting kind of I was thinking about it brought back that whole story and and obviously in that story for readers who who aren't aware it's like uh funes can remember everything in such detail that essentially it becomes a kind of paradoxical limitation on him that he cannot actually do anything it's like kind of zeno's paradox where you have right. an infinite number of moments so that you actually don't even you're stuck in the same moment the whole time right right um and i was curious i don't know how how you kind of like approach that paradox or how when you were thinking about Evram as a character um how you kind of sought to kind of get that idea of being able to remember everything across. I know there are some moments where he's, you know, he's, he's, or should I say they are um, like sitting and kind of in a sort of meditative state where it's quite difficult for her, the one of the protagonists to understand where their mind is, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is, you know, this relates to, I'm actually right now trying to get this down on, on paper, but it's a, it's a theory that I've, that I've, been developing for a few years about the way in which we construct and reconstruct the self mm -hmm. and um and, and I, I think it's i think i can explain it basically i view the self as a sort of triangle in in construct and this is uh, keep in mind that you know anything that i say is like a map and not you know a territory right it's, <laughs> yeah. this is just a, a a model and all models are, are are very are very basic simplifications but but in a sense i think what happens with the self Going back to that that idea of like a fox trying to determine where to put one foot in order to direct its action in in one way, I think that's the the core of all. I think that's that's what consciousness will eventually emerge from. 
is that act of knowing where you were in the past and directing your action toward a future moment and then having to be between those two moments and determine how to shift your balance or your position. So in every animal, you can argue that there is a sense of past, present, and future that's embedded in bodily movement. Yeah. Right. And then I think that consciousness extends out of that bodily movement. And at the level of human sophistication, what happens to the self is we have a sense of who we were in the past, which is constantly being read from the position of who we are now, mm -hmm. read and reread. And then we have a concept of who we can be or will be in the future, which is also constantly being re-read and 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 revised according to who we are now and who we are in the past and i think this is one of the reasons this accounts for some of the reasons why memory is so malleable yeah. right it's that from the position of the present time events in the past appear very differently and our perspective on them is continually changing so that for example you know um you might perceive a parent's utterance in a completely different way from your present position than you did 10 years ago. Oh. Um, a good example is I can remember growing up and thinking that this thing that my grandmother used to say to my father when he was a kid just didn't, you know, didn't seem nice. And it was, uh, you're no better than anyone else. Right. Right. But from my present position, I understand that what she was telling him that first of all, that that memory was incomplete and that what she had always said was, you're better, you're no better than anyone else and you're no worse. Yeah, and that's always the implication as well. That's kind of right. the important double side of that, yeah. Yeah, and so and so, I, I realized that like, there's this, that, that the self in a sense is structured as a conversation, a three-way conversation between future, present and past that kind of has this, that, that is mapped upon bodily movement, right? the movement forward of that, the placing of the limb, you know, and where we need to go in order to take our next successful step in yeah. pursuit of whatever the object is. And this seems intuitive to me that, that like that bodily movement becomes our conscious construction of self through this complex emergent process of language and, and our minds evolving and all of those things. So Evrim, to get to, to answer that question, would be someone who was locked in a different way, in a kind of conversation with something that was immutable, right? If you can remember everything, what that really means is you can't distort the past in order to suit a rewriting of the present moment and a rewriting of the future uh, possibility. Instead, you always have to be, remember, you know, basing that present moment in something concrete and i think when we start processing that as human beings we realize that that's horrifying yeah 100 percent. right yeah <laughs> that, that if you can't if you, if you can't leave the impression of the present moment on your past memories and somehow work them into that system of the self it may eventually lead somewhere really bad right Absolutely. i mean it could give you some some really superior qualities but very much like in the Borges story, like the end result is probably not great. And I did want to leave the reader with a sense of of unease about Evrim and like what happens, you know, in the book. I don't want to do, you know, do spoilers, but like, you know, it should leave the the reader with a, an uncomfortability about who who this being might be in the future, right? Um, and also just to just to just to sort of mark the difference right yeah. between a created mind and and a human mind and and the sort of limit of our of our understanding and the mistakes we might make when when trying to create a truly you know artificial intelligence yeah 100 percent. yeah i always thought a good um representation of basically the same thing that you were saying there was uh one of the early episodes of black mirror i don't know if you watched black mirror at all but um yeah. The entire history of you where they and the characters have uh basically implants in their head where they can replay memories right. exactly yeah. and, yeah. and and then the whole idea is that and i remember when i watched that when i was younger and 
I'd always I'd always been interested in this kind of idea of memory and I, I studied at a university mm-hmm. doing philosophy of memory related stuff with links to technology and things like that. Um and I remember when I was when I was watching that episode, I was just thinking, okay, you you always kind of are curious about what it would be like if you could remember certain events in the past like really clearly, like things from your childhood, things from you know any other part of of, of time. And then what Brooker does excellently in that in that episode and what you do I think quite well in the book as well is show how if we were capable of perfect recall all the time um it would send us into a sort of I mean Everham doesn't send him into a sort of like a negative spiral but he's not human but if for a, for a human to actually have um perfect recall would be an almost like impossible burden to bear because you'd be re- yeah. recalling all of these things even if it was selective um you could be mm-hmm. recalling all of these things that you know your brain has has changed and morphed and uh, distorted in particular ways for a reason (laughs) right right Right. i mean um how would you let's say you know how would an addict be able to move past all the terrible things they had to do you know in the past to get the you know the substance of their of their their choice and and see a future in which they could be a very different person if they were locked in constantly recalling those things in their detail in detail and unable to say things like okay you know i can restructure these memories as like here are all the terrible things that happen when you're an addict and these are all the motivations for me to become you know this kind of person so that i can do this in the future like it it sort of reminds me of i was um was in a a class on on uh, on the early Pali canon of, of Buddhism, and and one of the things that was brought up was this idea of grief, and how you know grief is related to grasping. And one of the things that the that the teachers said, which I thought was just an extraordinary revelation, was um, you when you're grieving over someone's death, the thing that that you should focus on is that for you, this is happening over and over again. But for the person who died, it only happened yeah. once. Yeah. One time. And 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 sometimes what you're doing when you're grieving is you're projecting the pain of that death experience back on their on them as if it happened to them over and over and over again, as if they're yeah. still suffering. But you, but you're the one who's suffering, right? Not them. And, and and sort of understanding that and trying to unlink those things really does, I think, help, you know, in this in this process. And similarly, I think being able to reinterpret your actions as like, okay, you know, so I, I did this as a kid, right? But I've changed since then. And maybe I did this because this was done to me. And, you know, that storytelling aspect, that conversational aspect of the self becomes a really powerful survival mechanism. Yeah necessary necessary yeah oh yeah interesting i mean i think i suppose like even in the book in relation to this kind of the idea of memory or kind of um or even if we expand it like further out in terms of what you were saying but in terms of um how our past links to the present and then the future in this triangle um i think one of the kind of interesting parts of the book that i think is kind of overlooked a little bit from some reviews and things i've seen on it is this world that you create which is, you know, this kind of speculative, like semi dystopian world, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of based on, it seems, because it, it operates quite in the background of the story, I suppose. It's not mm-hmm. kind of explicitly explained in any way. Um, but it seems to be, it was curious to me because essentially it's kind of a world that's moved away from the kind, the normal, what we consider normal in the 21st century to be kind of this normal idea of nation states and um, um, and things like that. And I, I was kind of curious to kind of pick your brain a little bit about that as somebody who's lived in various different countries, um, how you kind of came to start uh, exploring and developing this new world in which you kind of built the story around. Because um, to me, yeah. that was it was it was quite it was quite unique in the sense that it's 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 kind of kind of cyberpunk enough that it's still within the sci-fi realm but it's still very very it's still very very close to home you know and i feel it it sat very well there and i'm kind of interested to see how you how you developed it yeah i I mean i I think that the interesting thing about human 
history one of and again this is sort of about storytelling right mm. is that that as that that triad of the self my my argument is that it 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 applies to all entities mm. right and an entity is anything that is a living system even if it, it itself is not alive and is just composed of conscious living systems so an entity is also a state okay right? or an institution you know like the department of state or yeah, you know, yeah. the, the foreign office or, or or whatever is an entity right it has a, a life and it uh, but that life is composed of, of other lives and and all entities i think are triadic conversations in a sense like they have you know this is where we're going here is where we came from and that is what informs our our, our image of where we are today as a nation as a people whatever you know construct you create entities are sort of Russian dolls composed of other entities inside them, right? Yeah. And they're parts of other larger entities. But I think what's interesting about nation states is nation states are this kind of way of forming a thing out of nothing, yeah. right? Or out of materials that are disparate and, and often really um, contradict any sense of, of continuity. So... Right. When you're when you're telling that you know a nation state is basically a story that we're telling about a reason why we are together under the system that we have now and why we're headed in the place that we imagine ourselves going. What's really interesting about the nation state is when you like a few little sort of thought experiments will break its precepts apart. And you know, as you said the, to say this in, in Kosovo, we're working with with Albanians and of course the imaginary nation state is yeah. supreme in the balkans right yeah uh, and i would say to them imagine speaking to an albanian from a thousand years ago right that person doesn't want doesn't have anything in common with you yeah it's actually unlikely you'd be able to understand any of the words that came out of their mouth although technically they're supposed to speak the same language as you do now yeah Certainly, you would not understand any of their values. Their entire picture of the universe would be completely different from anything yeah. you could imagine today. They would be, they would have no um, no way to communicate their like concepts to you, and you would have very little way to communicate your concepts to them. And now, imagine, you know, a Serb of your age in Belgrade, yeah, trying to speak to that person. Well, yeah. they understand pretty much everything that you understand about the world and their values are much the same and the tele television shows they watch are much the same and all of these things are similar so how is it that your concept of what is included right with you is this person who has nothing in common with you but not this person who has almost everything in common with you right Absolutely. except for a few small things and that's how the nation state really functions to distort you know this process and so and the other way the nation state is interesting is like it arose really recently. Yeah. And and somehow is imagined as having been totally always there, just under the surface waiting to come out. Yeah. Something yeah. natural and permanent. Right. Yeah. And so I wanted to, you know, introduce other concepts for how, you know, these things might be be organized. And and I think one of the one of the inspirations was my own experience in Afghanistan. Right. So, you know, when I was in Afghanistan, one of the things that I saw with my own eyes and I had read a lot before I went there and, and, and that kind of thing. But one of the things I really saw with my own eyes is that there is no Afghanistan. Right. And one of the things that we're just fundamentally unable to understand is that, that if you wanted to have a better model for what Afghanistan is, a really good model would be a honeycomb in which each individual cell is a mountain valley and that and that hexagon rises and and becomes virtually impenetrable right and within that cell there's a culture living out its you know its life and every once in a while there's some tiny act of communication between those mountain valleys but yeah. otherwise those cells just remain completely isolated and there are hundreds of them so even when you are trying to organize the the you know the afghan people into well a people right that's i mean that's like well, that's one difficulty but even say tajiks yeah even that is an incredibly abstract 
concept. There are, there are so many different kinds of Tajiks in Afghanistan, depending on where they come from, including, you know, the descendants of the assassins right. Right? <laughs> still living up in, in, in the mountains and all cool. of these other fascinating subgroups. And and one of the one of the reasons why I think this this country has been such a um, thorn in the side of the attempts to make it something else is simply that like it just will not fit the pattern. Yeah. And so you know I I had suggested a long time ago that well I mean maybe the answer with Afghanistan was just to stop treating Afghanistan as if it were something that we want it to be and start treating it as as what it is but you know those are that's incredibly difficult to do in international politics where the nation state is now our supreme way of thinking about things for better or worse so yeah you have these different constructs and these different sort of things that i think will you know one day inevitably because all worlds end and all ways of ways of life eventually become something else there will be a world with human beings on it, I'm quite certain, in which we're not organized in the way that we're organized today, in which all of the, in which, you know, people might mourn the countries that exist today, but maybe in the same way that someone would vaguely mourn one of the Burgundies. Yeah, right? or Prussia <laughs> like, or, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah, Prussia or, <laughs> or, or, you know, like any of those of those countries that have just ceased to have any relevance, right, Yeah, uh, to us. And so, yeah, it, it's more of um, a thought experiment, and I, I try to I try to get people to to focus when reading science fiction on the idea that science fiction is not about prediction, right? It's about predication, oh. and predication is is the real strength of science fiction. It's it's predicating a different world upon some kind of change. Yeah, uh, doesn't have to be technological change. Uh, it could be, you know, something something very different it can be you know as it often is in alternate histories um somebody dies at the wrong time or someone is never born right and that and that changes the sort of uh you know histories that we that we have today so it's kind of like that i'm trying so in a way it's like i would think of it as an alternate history of the future it's yeah. one possible way things could be reconstructed after the nation state dies yeah right um and I, I do think <laughs> I was dealing with like the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and someone, uh, one of the books I was reading, you know, said the, you know, the ethnic tensions in Nagorno-Karabakh, you know, extend down through time to the depths of the 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It, it only goes back to the 19th century for so right. many of these as well. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> And that's exactly it. Like these things are not immortal. They're not even uh, that old. Yeah. Right. A hundred percent. I I had that same sort of realization. I read um, uh, Benedict Anderson's uh, Imagine Communities, which is ah, yes. like so. Yeah, and and like a, a while ago, and I had this same kind of realization of like, wow, I've always just been thinking about you kind of project this idea of the nation state into the past as if it's an eternal thing that's always existed, especially being like a, a, a British person where we have like mm -hmm. quite a long history. Um, right. well, I say we have a quite a long history, but there was right. quite a long history of, of communities in this country. So you always talk, it's always talked about of all oh, these thousands of years, for example, of British history that in places like yeah. the States or whatever, it might not be as, 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 uh, as clear as that. Um, and then suddenly realizing that actually all of these, all of these ideas are very, very recent, literally 19th century sort of inventions based on, you know, the development of the printing press all the way through to kind of this this 19th century nationalism that was that was yeah. taking part, which eventually led to the First and Second World Wars, uh, you know, ironically. Right. So it's actually, yeah, it's, it's a curious thing about how how we kind of consider nations and and how like kind of bringing it back to your point as well about how nations and and sort of entities operate collectively. Because mm -hmm. I think there's definitely a parallel there with um, with the octopus and the kinds of things that, that are going on in the book, because right. um, you have essentially these entities that are operating in the book, right, that are not controlled by uh, the head of the, the entity, or there mm -hmm. are lots of different arms that are going around in different directions, and the mm -hmm. head maybe has its ultimate control over it, mm -hmm. kind of like how the octopus operates. Right. And, and also the other kind of the other great parallel that I like that you drew was um, with Alton Setzeg and her AI drones. 
um yeah. and how that that just like blew my mind when i read it i thought it was amazing how how she sort of like was making that parallel between the octopus as well it's like i'm i'm in control of them but they're sort of an extension of my body because they don't mm -hmm. actually they're not they are still ai driven so they're not 100 percent controlled by me but anyway those those kind of three parallels i thought i thought were really um really interesting like was that something that was like intentional or did that just sort of arise uh, as as you started writing I mean, I think it. I think it arose, and then when it arises, you see its potential, and it becomes it becomes more intentional. You shape mm. it, and then I, I think that um, one thing that readers often forget about a writer's process, because um, you know they're perceiving this finished the finished product, is that there are things that happen in the rewriting. Yeah, sure. Right? And so a lot of foreshadowing is only done. <laughs> after the book has been finished yeah, right yeah, yeah because once the once you finish the first draft well then you can go back and line things up properly so that they yeah. you know they fall into place and put things hints toward things that happen and that doesn't i think i think it's quite often you know readers don't don't necessarily have that concept that that the writer has gone back after having finished their own book reread it and inserted things in order to lead you in certain ways and and it is this like very manipulative you know process <laughs> i mean manipulation not necessarily in, in a in a in a negative way but like they're trying to yeah you know this has been constructed and reconstructed it's it wasn't just built from you know beginning to end and then the writer wrote the end and that was it 100%. and somebody edited it or something i mean there, so so i think that it was initially like sort of emergent on my thinking and the, and the reading i was doing and then later i directed it into the channels that i wanted to to direct it and try to give it some more scope I'm actually writing, you know, I'm in the process of writing a book now. I've finished the book. I've given it to my agent. My agents read it. My publishers read it. And now I'm in rewrite. And what comes out of the end of rewrite will be, you know, very significantly different. Because now I've taken on a lot. I've had readers. And so I know what they missed and didn't get and these kind of things. And now I'm going to go back and, you know, suture and tie up and, and knit yeah, yeah, yeah. and do all those things. Um, it's so will, this be, will this be the, the third book? after yeah. tusks the tusks of extinction yes so yeah. um so tusks of extinction is a novella thirty thousand mm -hmm. words about 200 pages about half as long as as the mountain in the mm -hmm. sea a little less than half and then this will be a a, a novel probably is going to fall around seventy five thousand words um mountain sea is about eighty five thousand, so it'll be a similar length yeah the, the book the second novel <laughs> yeah yeah okay yeah. interesting <laughs> um and yeah. do you know sorry a little bit of a sidetrack here but about yeah. tusks of extinction um quite curious about that obviously having really enjoyed um mountain in the sea i was curious to see um you know could you could you potentially give our readers like a little bit of a premise about what happens in the in the story uh maybe a little bit of a kind of a, a teaser <laughs> yeah teaser trailer. yeah absolutely so the tusks of extinction the premise is this that moscow has brought back the mammoth mm -hmm. um and uh but but the project begins to fail because they have mammoth mammoth genetics and they can physically bring the mammoth back, but they can't bring back mammoth culture. Wow. Um, elephants and, and mammoths and these, and especially these animals with big brains, they, they rely on culture to teach them how to be what they are. It's not just genetic. It's not, it's not, it's not all instinct. And so what happens is they bring back a scientist whose mind was basically mapped before she was, um, she was a, an, an expert in elephant behavior and was instrumental in trying to save the elephant from extinction, but she failed and was murdered. Um, but they bring back her stored mind and they put it in the in, in the brain of a mammoth in order to lead this mammoth tribe okay. and teach them how to be what they are, basically. Love so, it. yeah, that's the, yeah, so it's, it, and this one's all about kind of embodiment of meaning and and the way in, you know in which form affects thought and and, and all of these kinds of, of things I, I, along with much else i think i think people who like the mountain and the sea will really enjoy it the third book is going to be much more about the geopolitics and and the way that individuals and and you know high level geopolitics sort of interact um, so less about consciousness and more about the ways in which we're constructed you know, by our, our geopolitical environments. Okay, interesting, yeah. I mean, I suppose that definitely, talking about the mammoth culture there, that, that kind of ties in exactly what we were saying about these kind of imagined communities or uh, the yeah. way that we form 
cultures based on these ideas of the past that we have if suddenly you were brought into a past where you didn't know anybody even though you're in the same land and you're amongst the same genetically similar types of people uh you may not have like you wouldn't be able to communicate you wouldn't have a right. clue what to do you know right. yeah right. interesting yeah what, what what do you think brought you also from from octopuses to mammoths or to, to elephants is because there's obviously that connection between the fact that um you know highly intelligent animals etc but um was there any a thought process there yeah it's hard to it's hard to place it exactly but um i kind of think like books the books that i write and the stories that i write they're kind of like these little ice cores of my of like whatever my thought process was during that period and a novel is like a bit longer a short story might be a little bit less um you know of a of, of a maybe like fewer layers in there right because there's less in a, in a short story by by nature but um toward the end of my research for the mountain and the sea i started to read a book by um eva yablonka who is a geneticist i was really looking at what i was trying to make sure that i understood properly was epigenetics mm -hmm. and um because epigenetics are very important to octopus evol evolution so it's one of those like rabbit holes I went down that ends up being like one sentence in the book yeah but but, but involved reading like you know 20 books <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so sometimes it's like a few chapters sometimes you're literally like okay so I learned all this about epigenetics in order to write one <laughs> sentence about, about epigenetics. it goes in the background somewhere I mean. right <laughs> <laughs> um and the book was extremely complicated but the argument that the book made was that a lot of evolution is actually an, a conversation in a, in a sense between the um, analog physical culture and genetics so that like these things are affecting one another and without the physical culture you don't get a lot of evolution that evolution is not entirely random because the ways animals are using their bodies creates what is successful form or not right so and then that reads back into how genetics evolve um you know so and how mutations would be used things like that so i found that really fascinating and she she talks a little bit about the uh these monkeys on on this island it's it's a relatively well-known story where the, the monkeys learn to wash yams so they were given yams by these Japanese scientists so that they would come down onto the beach. And, and, the, and, and the, the monkeys would eat the yams, but the yams were not that great because they were always covered in sand. Okay. And then one day, one of the monkeys went into the water and washed a yam. And it happened about 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so that monkey washed a yam and then the monkeys learned from that monkey how to wash yams and the, and the monkeys would come and they would get the yams and then they would go into the water and wash the yams well that monkey died a long time ago but the monkeys on that island all wash yams in yeah. in the water when they're given them because that's that's the, what they learned and perhaps more interestingly they swim because they got into the water to wash their yams and then they started playing in the Lovely water started, mm, yeah really and so now they they're in the water a lot they swim they wash their yams they they you know the the, the baby monkeys play in the waves and stuff and they have like an aquatic culture right well an, an aquatic culture based on one monkey washing a yam yeah right right right, right. And, and these monkeys are genetically i'm i'm sure I, because 50 years is not enough for genetic change identical yeah. to the non yam washing monkeys sure right and the same thing is happening all over in life right yeah. birds are teaching their young their the the songs songs have bird song has dialects um you know uh lots of behaviors that we attribute to instinct are learned behaviors and yeah. and so i got fascinated by that concept of of you know re de extinction and how how would you teach learned behaviors and then I was thinking about you know some of the things I developed in the mountain and the sea about this sort of uploading and downloading minds and some of that yeah. stuff and that kind of wove into I thought I'd really like to find a framework you know within which to explore some of those ideas and I was sort of also thinking like what about like an upside down Jurassic Park right kind of sense, right where and where instead of the the animals being the like bad guys it was sort of the other way around right okay so that's yeah. sort of one of the other concepts of, of the book is that it's about pitting these you know 
mammoths against all of the political forces around them as yeah. well. Yeah. So. <laughs> Interesting. I, I mean, I'm super excited uh, to read it. And I think I'm basically going to be keeping up with uh, anything else that you've written in the future. I'll probably delve yeah, into the, uh, the short stories as well. Um, but Ray, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Um, Thanks, hopefully man. we'll keep in contact and uh yeah when the um do you have a release date by the way for the tusks of extinction in the uk just in case anyone would be interested so uh so tor.com has the global rights yep. that should make the uk release the same as the us release january 16th 2024 and if anyone's interested in reading my short stories i would mention that over a dozen of them are available on my website for free these are all and all of the ones that are available on the website were published in professional magazines they're not leftovers they are yeah. like what i you know a record of what i've published over the years so you can, you can certainly read them there um and then other ones are available at clark's world and light light speed um usually if there's an online outlet i try not to reduplicate on my on my website because i want yeah. people to, come to clark's world and light speed and read them there so that stuff is out there uh, a lot of it most most of my work is is actually available although i still don't have an english collection i will have a french collection this fall Ah, no okay. Someone will need to translate it back in back into English then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Matt. This has been really Thanks good. a lot. It's been great speaking to you, Ray. Take care. Thanks.